Hello and welcome to Inside Intelligence, brought to you by the Intelligence Analysis Program and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features Josh Kerbel discussing complexity and the challenge for intelligence analysis. My name is Peter Huggins, and I'm the event producer. Please note today's program will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Inside Intelligence playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function, and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to our moderator, Dr. Michael J. Ard, Program Director and Senior Lecturer for the Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis Program. Thank you very much, Peter, and welcome everyone to Inside Intelligence. Today, we will discuss the difficult concept of complexity and how it relates to intelligence analysis. And with us to discuss that is a great guest, Josh Kerbel, who's a member of the research faculty at National Intelligence University, where he explores the increasingly complex security environment and the associated intelligence challenges that go along with that. Prior to joining NIU, he held senior analytic positions at DIA, ODNI, which included the National Intelligence Council, Navy staff, CIA, and the ONI, ONI National uh, Office of Naval Intelligence. His writings on the intersections of government and especially intelligence and complexity have been published in Foreign Policy, The Washington Post, Studies in Intelligence, The National Interest, The Hill, and other important outlets. Mr. Cabell has degrees from Georgetown at George Washington University in the London School of Economics, as well as professional certifications from the Navy War College and Naval Postgraduate School. Josh, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So, so over to you, talk about uh, complexity and uh, or I'll try not to use the word complicated uh, as we go. I'll talk a little bit about the distinction. Uh, so thank you for having me, I think this, this is great. Uh, I wanted to start off really by digging right into this word complexity, because I would argue that it's uh, probably the most overused, but also misunderstood term in, in the, today's national security discourse. Uh, if you look at almost any uh, political or strategic document, uh, listen to a, a, a strategic speech, um, read a book or whatever, you'll, you'll find the term complexity probably strewn throughout. It's, it's everywhere today. It's almost impossible to get by it. You look at the national defense strategy, the national security strategy, the national intelligence strategy, and you'll see multiple references to how the world is increasingly complex. We say this uh, and we don't really give it that much thought. And if you really think when you look at it, you see how apparent that really is. Uh, because what we end up often doing is using the term synonymously with complicated. Mm -hmm. right? For most people, um, and this is, this is not unusual, in idiomatic speech, we tend to do that, right? If we've said something is uh, complex and we want to reiterate the point or reinforce it and not repeat ourselves, we tend to say it's complicated. And that may be fine for idiomatic speech or colloquial language, uh, but it's really problematic when we're actually talking about systems because in systems parlance, those two terms refer to very different kinds of systems. And when you begin to conflate them, you often begin to think about the things as, as being the same. And when they're not, that sets you up for a lot of problems. And one of the reasons for this is, is that our formative experience as a national security community was really a complicated problem, right? So the, the Cold War really in, in systems parlance, we wouldn't consider it to be particularly complex. Uh, it was complicated. So I want to spend just a little time really in my, in my remarks talking about the distinction between the two and why it's important that we really understand that. So a complicated system um, is really a system that tends to have uh, pretty clear or closed edges, often a closed system, um, and pretty fixed relationships between the pieces in it and the, system, and the pieces themselves tend to remain pretty consistent over time, right? It's often a hierarchical kind of relationship. And as a result of that, complicated systems tend to behave in, in, a, in a very little, we might term a linear fashion, right? They have um, certain, you know, like cause and effect dynamics that are often very clear. 
And the Cold War and the Soviet Union were essentially complicated systems, much more on the complicated end of the scale, right? So in the case of the Soviet Union, it was a closed system, partly by its own paranoia, partly by American policy of containment, right? With a very hierarchical structure internally. And then the Cold War itself it was in many ways a very two-body pr problem, right? The US, USSR, a NATO, Warsaw Pact, um, East-West kind of thing, basically two hierarchies confronting each other. Um, and two-body problems tend to be hit very linear in turn, right? So it was a very complicated relationship in the sense um, that there was a lot of predictability. It was a pretty stable kind of environment for the most part. One side pushed, the other side pushed back. Um, in a proportionate kind of, kind of way. Sometimes when you think about complicated systems, it helps to think of it if, you th if you're used to thinking of the concept of finite or infinite games, um, a much more finite kind of system, right? Uh, a complicated environment tends to have set rules. They often are winners and losers in that kind of environment. A complex environment or a complex system, on the other hand, is really, really different from that, right? Complex systems tend to be open in the sense that they're often not hierarchical, but they're networked and the edges are really unclear, right? So it's really hard to say where a complex system begins or ends, right? Um, it's just it's just not as distinct like that. So your car um, is a complicated system, right? It's very clear edges. Um, but uh, the world as we're looking at it today really is not uh, it's really, it's, it's, it's truly complex. And the thing about complex systems is whereas you have this linear predictability that go with complicated systems, in complex systems, we tend to get these nonlinear behaviors, right? And we turn to, we, we call those emergent behaviors, right? Um, these are behaviors that kind of grow out of the system as, as a whole. And the way that the environment changed in the last 30 years from that sort of formative Cold War complicated experiences. Well, you know, we've had, um, in the case of the USSR, obviously the USSR imploded, um, but we had then had Russia, um, which began to integrate with the outside world and integrate with itself, right? We had China post Tiananmen, which had also been in many ways complicated in the sense that it was very hierarchical and it was a closed off system, begins to integrate with itself and with the rest of the world. And then, of course, that physical inter that physical growth and interconnectivity um, and interdependence was supercharged in the last 30 years by the information technology revolution, right? So now we have this virtual domain, which in many ways didn't even exist prior to 1989, and now in many ways is sort of this dominant domain, right? And this this growth in complexity, which is really about interconnectivity and interdependence, allows for this growth of these nonlinear emergent phenomena, right? So this we would think of more in terms of an infinite game, right? Uh, where there really aren't solutions, there aren't necessarily wins or losses, it doesn't really end. Um, this is an environment where, where rather than trying to win it, you're just trying to really manage it successfully. Uh, so very different from that kind of complicated environment that was the formative experience for us as a national community, as a national security community. Because we build all of our habits, all of our structures, all of our procedures and processes. Um, our formative experience was that complicated environment of the Cold War. So these emergent phenomena that kind of now dominate the national security spectrum, if I can use that term in a lot of ways, um, they're, they're, they're really products of this complexity. Right, and you can go through the whole list of them. Right? Climate change, uh, financial contagion, urbanization, migration, infosphere contamination, um, cyber cascades, and of course the big one, you know, which we're living with still even now, um, pandemics, right? Mm -hmm. All of these, um, these are really highly emergent phenomena. They're not directed by anyone, right? Nobody in Beijing or Moscow or Washington or London said do this and it happened, right? These are things that grew organically out of this interconnectivity and this interdependence. And in many ways, I would argue, these are the kinds of problems that tend to dominate the national security spectrum that we're looking at today. Now, one of the interesting things or actually one of the more frightening things that I tend to encounter a lot as I move around the intelligence community, which I, which I do a lot of, um, 
experience is I'm increasingly coming across people, not even increasingly, it's just, uh, there's just a steady amount of people who basically express the sentiment to me, well, thank God for the Russians or for the Chinese, right? Because people want to think that the Russians or the Chinese in many ways, that this is the kind, that, that these are complicated problems, right? International terrorism, which in many ways was a complex problem, um, that may have been very disorienting for us as, as the national security community. But we think about Russia, we think about China, a lot of the times we say, oh, well, these are nation states, right? These are things that this is being controlled from Beijing. This is being controlled from Moscow, right? And I can think about these things today the same way that I thought about the USSR. Right. And I can use all of those lessons that I developed and gleaned during the Cold War and which I won successfully and use them against these problems. And, and I would argue that this is really a major problem for us, not just as a community, as an intelligence community, but as a larger national security community and certainly even as a nation and as an international community, because Russia and China today are extraordinarily complex. They are not if you try to think about them and the, and the challenges they pose purely in terms of how we thought about the Soviet Union, um, we're gonna be in big trouble, right? Because both of them are truly plugged in and interconnected, right? Again, as I mentioned, that cyber domain didn't even exist really in 1989. And now we might argue it's probably the predominant domain of warfare and even generally competition, right? And they are of course running amok in that environment. Um, and it's an environment that enables uh, countries that even if they don't have advanced traditional military capabilities, if they have advanced cyber capabilities because of this interconnectivity, these, these open networks, um, an extraordinary degree of power in terms of mucking about with the system. So the rule, the things that we use to think about Russia and China, I think, are going to be extraordinarily different. And, and this is, I think, really hard for us, right? Because again, we tend to look at them and we think, oh, well, you know, we're back to nation states and I can think about them the way that I did the Soviet Union and I can draw on all that great experience and apply it to these and it will lead me in the end to a victory. And of course, I would argue that there probably isn't an end there, you know, it's not the conflicts one end. It just morphs because it is an infinite game kind of environment. So that problem, this issue of our formative experience having been complicated and our problems and challenges today really in many ways being complex poses a significant uh, degree of challenge for particularly for intelligence analysis, right? Because we have all kinds of processes and procedures in place and habits that we developed over time and we may have upgraded them, but in many ways they've been continuous. That they're not going to necessarily serve us well in thinking about these kinds of problems, right? There, there's cognitive challenges, there's organizational challenges, behavioral challenges, linguistic challenges. And I don't just mean foreign languages. I actually mean in particular how we use language ourselves. Um, there are issues about what we measure to how we try to you know, incentivize success. Um, there are information. Anyway, there's a whole slew of things uh, going back to almost sort of first principles of everything that we are in terms of our workforce and our structures that we would probably have to address in order to be able to effectively address emergent challenges. And I would argue that we're way behind the curve here and maybe falling further behind because we continue in our minds to think that what we're essentially dealing with is a complicated problem, which it's not. So. Um, why don't I stop there as sort of an intro, right. we can get into a little of a discussion in a Q&A. Okay. All right. That's a great beginning for this. There's a lot of, obviously, a lot of questions come to mind right away. And uh, one is, uh, let's get, let's go back to um, the structure. So we're an intelligence community here in the U.S. Uh, we have lots of components, but um, it's, it tends to, I think, be directed towards functional areas such as weapons of mass destruction or, or terrorism, what have you, and uh, regional areas, right? So countries, so, or, and so how, but what you're talking about really 
encompasses all of that. I mean, these are global phenomena. All the things that you mentioned were global phenomena that have that have impact on lots of different areas, including our adversaries at the same time they're impacting us. Yeah, this might be sort of the largest, the, the most overarching problem that we have. And unfortunately, organizational change has gotten a bad name over time because we, you know, while we, we think about organizational change, but usually what we've done is we've just grafted on new layers and we haven't really changed our organizations, right? Um, we are still a highly insular community that is very hierarchical in our structures, right? And as you go down through the ranks, you have a need to know requirements and very distinct lanes and accounts, right? Essentially what we are, what we have built as a community is we have built a complicated community. Um, and that's problematic. It's not unusual. Organizations often take on the appearance of the thing that they were created to address, right? Um, and if you look at us, even today, we are organizationally a mirror image of the Soviet Union, right? Which is of course problematic considering the Soviet Union has been gone for 30 years, um, but, but we are, right? And there's, there's all kinds of organizational psychological reasons that go into this, something called the mirroring law and mirroring thesis, this notion that organizations organize the way they think. We tend to think in this kind of hierarchical, complicated fashion. So we've organized ourselves that way. And it worked well for a problem like the Soviet Union. But I would argue that organizationally, we are going to have to change um, and become a much more complicated, a much more complex type of community, which would be a community that is actually much more networked. And this is a problem, right? Because one of the things that need to know, you know, and a highly classified community, um, we have these strict sort of divides, right? You need to, yeah. you know, so in many ways that drives you, you know, compartmentalization, information compartmentalization, right? Drives you to a complicated kind of structure. Um, right. And again, it's, that structure is not gonna work for us because the, the boundaries which we have created between things are really blurred today. You know, these functional areas, these geographic areas, nothing is purely confined to any particular geographic area anymore, right? Nothing is purely confined in many ways to a functional area. All of our traditional organizing principles, be them, you know, global, national, regional, war, peace, foreign, domestic, all these sort of categories that we created um, they're all blurred today and they're blurring even more as we go. So um, the organizational change that's required is immense. And I would argue that we have barely even nibbled at this. Um, this is the, and, and, it's, and, and I, I'll be the first to admit that this is hard. It may be impossible to do in a highly classified environment. It may require a parallel structure or something different um, as a complement. It's a great conversation to have. Um, this is one of the things that frustrates me most of all, but it is a hard conversation to have. We're still locked in, would you say, to language from the Cold War or categories that we, which we saw the world, um, well, as we talked about, now we're moving to, you know, great power competition now is our big challenge, right? This is the big intelligence challenge. And that was, I mean, that was been put forth in many, government documents. Is that part of your, is that part of the problem? I mean, we're just, re, we're just sort of imagining it as just a little bit of a recast of the old problem. Yeah, I think, and I think that's what makes, you know, this notion of, you know, you, you see it in the vocabulary everywhere, right? You see constant references to like the new cold war or the second cold war, the next cold war or cold war 2.0. That language I would argue is lazy and really dangerous. We need to move beyond even referring to it, to, to that kind of language because um, in cognitive linguistics, there's this notion of framing, right? And what we have done by saying that is we are still priming ourselves, verbally priming ourselves and to think mentally about complicated systems. We have to describe it differently and use different language if we're going to think about it differently. This is something that is, is really tough for a lot of people because they're used to using terminology and, and they believe they know what they mean when they use terminology, um, but they don't really think that much about it. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is our language is intricately connected with our thought. You kind of vaguely know that, right? People often say, oh yeah, Orwell said that. 
and others have said that. But um, we now have 40 years of really deep cognitive linguistic research, which shows us how powerful the language we use exerts on our thought processes. Um, and our language is almost overwhelmingly complicated, right? So we see this in the metaphors that we use, right? If you look at the metaphors, which we tend to tend to dominate, not just the intelligence community, but in general, the national security discourse, they're almost all drawn from Newtonian mechanics mm -hmm. for working rate for linear mechanical complicated systems. Terrible for thinking about complex ones, but we use them anyway because we're used to them um, and using nonlinear metaphors drawn from more organic fields often seems awkward to us. Um, and we just sort of deny, we say, oh, well, you know, it's just figures of speech or it's just semantics. And of course it's not, right? This language um, is a major problem in terms of how it affects our thought. And we're sloppy in our use of language, right? We conflate complicated with complex. You know, we say emergent all the time, but we are not really thinking about emergence, that whole kind of linear, nonlinear process I was talking about. Our metaphors tend to be dominated by Newtonian mechanics. And then we're still sort of framing everything in Cold War terms. So um, I would argue we're never going to think effectively about this new environment until we take a good, really hard look at our own vocabulary, which of course is not something people are prepared to do, right? They're like, oh, I wanna talk about Russia or I wanna talk about China. I don't wanna talk about us. And this is a problem for the intelligence community because as you know, we don't like to talk about blue. Let me, let me, I, that's, that's a great uh, segue into my next question, which is given the problems that you're talking about and an environment of, of complexity, uh, and given that our typical habit is no, we don't, we don't comment on US policy or the role that US policy might play in this environment, then how do we actually analyze it? Yeah, so you really can't, right? This is, this is one of the challenges for intelligence analysis, which we, have, we haven't really touched, but we're going to have to. And that is the old Cold War prohibition about the U.S. intelligence community looking at blue has got to go away, mm -hmm. right? Because um, the fact of the matter is, and, and it's funny how we're sort of, we had this cognitive dissonance about this, right? We'll talk about, you know, American power, right? Like, and this is one of the fascinating things about like the late nineties, this whole discussion about American preeminence and the unipolar moment, right? Um, but then we wanna talk about countries as though they don't do things or other things that don't, don't happen because of our own behavior. In a complex environment, you can't take one of the actors that is so integrated into that environment and just pretend it doesn't exist. You're not having a real conversation. Um, so this is something, you know, that we've gotten in the habit of saying is, is we don't do blue, you know, we're going to just look at red. Well, you can't have a real conversation about red without right. yeah. exploring. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, the example I like to use is, uh, you know, during uh, quantitative easing, you know, if you ask a question about like, oh, what, how's that impacting, say, food prices in country X? Well, I can't comment on Fed policy as an analyst, you know. And, but it's ridiculous because obviously you see what's happening, uh, how yep. say Fed, you know, central bank policy will affect uh, the economies in different countries that you're studying. Yeah, you, you have to, there's no way around it. Uh, and, and most analysts haven't been trained or even attuned to really thinking about it, right? Now during the cold war, we didn't have to that much because first American policy was consistent over time, right? It was containment. We always knew what it, what it was and, you know, it didn't change. But today, if you ask an American policymaker, what is American policy? We'll say to you, well, where and when? You mean this week or next week, right? Because the world is so fluid and, flu and dynamic today that policy is as well, right? And that means that American intelligence analysts have to be attuned to it. They have to pay more attention to it than we did in the past. Right. And it's just not something that we're used to doing. And, and a lot of them will just say to you, Look, I don't have time for that. Right. Look, I know the China community really well because that's the community that I came out of. Mm -hmm. And there's so much stuff to read there every day. Right. It's just, you know, if I talk to analysts about this, they'll say, 
I don't have time to read about the United States because I have so much about China to read, right? And I still can't keep my head above the water, right? But this is, and this is one of the challenges of being an intelligence analyst today is I would argue that the requirement today is really in many ways so much greater because, you know, in the Cold War environment, we never had enough information, right? It was a classified world. We always wanted more. But in the environment that we live in analytically today, it's not a matter of not having enough. It's the exact opposite problem. We're drowning, right? The question for analysts is, is, is not, you know, I, that I need more. So that I have so much, how do I make sense of what I'm swimming in? Mm-hmm. So there, some of the fundamental questions that underpin what we do as intelligence analysts, we're going to have to, we're going to have to grapple with them. And I would argue that, that other than talking about them a little bit, we're not really grappling about them in terms of the changes that would be required. One, I mean, so this gets to, leads to a couple other questions. One is, um, what about the new, what kind of intelligence analysts do we need for this type of environment? I mean, we, uh, you know, we're recruiting in a traditional way. We're recruiting really in the same way we always have recruited, I think. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, along with that structural thing, this is in many ways the fundamental question, right? Um, you need a different kind of person or you need actually, or people we have but they're going to have to make some, some adaptations, right? So in the intelligence community, we call our, our, our thinkers, right? We call them analysts, right? And we do that because what they do is analysis. The whole term analysis is derived from the Greek. It means to break down. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of thinkers that we are, right? That's how, that's how we've been trained through our educations for the most part, is to be analytic thinkers. And, and, and to be an analytic thinker, there's really four fundamental rules to analytic thought, right? We've all had them ingrained in us if we've been educated in the West um, over time. Um, No one's ever said them to us, right? Like hardly anyone ever said to you, these are the four rules that you're gonna learn to think by. But this is what we've pretty much ingrained in all of our our people in school, right? Number one, the whole is equal to the sum of its parts, right? That's the fundamental rule of analysis, right? So if that is so, well, then you can attack a problem by understanding the parts. You can put them together and you'll understand the whole. Rule number two, there's a clear and identifiable cause and effect. And if I don't see it beforehand, I will be able to see it in retrospect. Um, Rule number three, the system is repeatable, right? Which means the way it behaved yesterday or the way it behaves today is likely to be the way it's going to behave tomorrow and into the future. And if it deviates, it's going to deviate on, if you were to map it over time, in smooth linear lines or incrementally, it's not going to head into a disruptive state. And then the fourth rule is the rule of proportional input output. A little bit of an input gets me a little bit of an output. A lot of an input gets me a lot of an output, right? Tap on the brake, slow down a little, slam on the brake, slow down a lot, again, a car. Those rules are great. Those analytical rules are great for thinking about complicated systems. Those rules are terrible for thinking about complex ones. If you apply those four rules of thought to a complex system, you are setting yourself up for surprise and for failure. And almost none of our analysts have been educated and trained in a way um, to not think according to those four rules, right? Because in many ways, it's an opposite kind of thinking. It's, It's really synthetic thinking. It's not analytic thinking. And that's not something which we have traditionally prioritized in our educational system, right? We ask students to specialize, to build themselves. You know, you major in something in college um, and you, you have knowledge. And we hire according to that, right? We hire people because they know something, right? Um, we still tend to have this sort of glorious image of expertise, which while necessary is in and of itself insufficient, right? We still, we often downgrade breath, right? We have a jack of all trades kind of thing, but you really do need both, right? You need a synthetic capability and an expertise, a deep capability, right? What's sometimes referred to is you need this sort of T-shaped individual or T-shaped organizations to deal with complexity. And we don't have it. We're I-shaped. And this is going to be fundamental in terms of how we recruit and how we train. And it's going to require the educational system to actually start teaching uh, students to, to think differently. And we don't spend a lot of time there, right? Most of us, 
if we're in college, we, we don't engage in a great deal of metacognition. Um, I, I come across a ton of people. Um, people are very unfamiliar with their own ways of thinking, right? They haven't really, maybe if they took a, a philosophy class um, or in logic, they've engaged in a bit, but most people haven't. Um, they may know a lot about their subject matter, but they don't really know an awful lot about their mind and their cognitive inclinations. And we do very little in our educational system to promote that, right? It's, we, we still focus on subjects, but not our own, you know, thinking about thinking. And I think this is something which we're gonna really have to address if we're gonna address and build a community that is truly synthetic and not just analytic. Let me get to some of the questions now. I don't want to monopolize them all here. And uh, there's a there's quite a few of them here in the Q&A and chat. So let me st get started. Uh, Bob asks, is it reasonable to conclude that many or most attempts at prediction in complex environments is a fool's errand? Would senior policymakers accept that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And the answer is yes. Um, complex systems by definition are often extraordinarily unpredictable in the sense that um, emergence is, is, is a highly unpredictable phenomena. That's, so there is a problem. Like a lot of times policymakers want us to predict, right? They often want to know what's most likely and what's most dangerous. And that's what, fine if you're dealing with a complicated problem, but if you're dealing with something that's truly complex, those are dangerous questions to answer. Because we know from experience that the things that we often say are most likely are not actually what happens, right? But if you, you say this is most likely and this is most dangerous, policymakers will often plan for that, looking at that as a spectrum and say, well, I'll get both of those and then I can handle anything in the middle, which is simply not true, right? So the idea here really has to be to have a much more imaginative process where it's not about prediction, but it's about possibilities. How could the system behave? Um, and the idea here would be for policymakers then to craft policies that are resilient across the range, right? They may not be optimized for any single one outcome, but the objective here is to, when you're dealing with complexity is resilience. It's, it's not to be the turtle on its back that can't flip itself over, right? You may still take hits, but you want to be resilient. You want to be durable. You want to be able to, to be still able to, to strike back, to respond, to go on. Um, so the question is, it, it really nails it that we, these are changes that we're not going to make in the intelligence community purely on our own. There's a whole set of expectations on the policy side that needs to be addressed where they have to understand, they too have to be educated in this sense of what it means to be dealing with complexity and understand what a good question is, right? And a lot of times that's the essence is just finding a better question, a way of framing and thinking about the issue. There are no good answers here, you know, fundamental definitive answers. And this is part of the problem, right? We've always judged people based on their ability to arrive at answers. It's like, this goes back to the educational thing, like, like the SAT, right? All those questions have answers. It's, it's not really a very useful way to measure when you're dealing with a community with, with issues, the, an infinite game kind of community. There really aren't any answers, right? There are just possibilities. So um, I think the question is right, that, that it's, they are unpredictable, um, but this is something that we cannot change without also having a serious conversation with the policy community and its expectations for us. And a lot of the time we don't want to do that, right? We just what they'll, they'll ask us and we'll give them an answer. And that may be the worst thing. Like I remember when we were always told, you know, the message was always, you know, show courage and make the call, make the call, right? And we would make the call. Um, extraordinarily dangerous if, the, if it's an important call and it's really wrong. Um, there's a good chance it will be when you're dealing with complexity. So a whole range of expectations has to change. But yes, they are, complex problems are inherently unpredictable. And that means the relationship with the policymaker and the policymaker's expectations has to change. So given that, do we have any tools or models that we can use for analyzing complex systems? 
So we do. Um, this is not an easy thing. Um, one of the most important things for thinking about complexity is, is visualization, right? In the intelligence community, we tend to be a very prose-based community even today. Um, we, 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 we're serious and we work in words, right? We work in language. But prose drives you to, to linear thought, right? Um, in a lot of ways. In fact, there's a famous quote by Peter Senge, he wrote in Fifth Discipline, you know, that any prose-based description of a complex problem is inherently suspect and it's true, right? Really to think about complexity, you have to visualize. You need to use visualization techniques. And to be honest, most analysts Skills in this area are, are, they leave something to be desired, right? And why not, right? If you ask an analyst, which is something that I do an awful lot, is for them to draw me a picture of their problem, right? Um, they will look at it and say, well, I haven't drawn a picture since the fifth grade, right? Because no one's asked me to do that through my higher education. And of course, that's the problem, right? They need to be able to think visually about complexity, right? sort of deciding what it is, you know, the problems that we're dealing in that interconnectivity. Um, and we don't know how to do that. So I would argue one of the most important tools, there's computer methods to do this, but there's also just the methods of butcher block paper, dry erase markers and so forth, is visualization has to become a much bigger part of what we do as analysts or really as synthesis, right? It's, it's a fundamental tool. Um, again, there's there's tools for that, but then there's other techniques as well of things which are are, are useful. Um, computer modeling and simulation, agent-based modeling, wargaming is an incredibly synthetic process. Something that I'm a big fan of and have often been a participant in. Of course, these kinds of techniques are things that um, often require a number of people. They take time. They're not easy things for analysts to do alone at their desk. Uh, so it, it, this means a different model of intelligence analysis, right? An analysis process that is much more collaborative than it is traditionally of the analyst sitting in his cube or her cube and writing their paper, right? Um, but yes, but there are tools. Um, and of course, I would argue that the whole quiver of futures approaches and techniques are really fundamental to sort of imagining and synthesizing thought about the future. Good. How about, um, you know, a lot of the problems that you uh, are, have described here briefly um, would seem to be to require more cooperation between government, and private industry, uh, government and uh, academia. What do you think and how do you see that playing out and dealing with the complexity? Yeah, so this is something obviously we talk about a lot, right? But I'm not sure how much progress we've made in actually making it happen. The walls, both physical um, and cognitive around the intelligence community are still pretty high. Um, and I, I think we're gonna have to find a way, and again, it may be a parallel structure. Um, and I, I understand that nobody wants to just build something new, you know, in, so that's, just a, that's another conversation, but, but yes, it's got to be a much more collaborative process. Let's face it, today the intelligence community doesn't have the monopoly on information that it had in the days of the Soviet Union, right? In, 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 the 19, in 1985, if you wanted imagery, it was going to be up to the, you know, the intelligence community. But today, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at imagery of what's going on in Ukraine, you know, with incredible resolution, it's available to anybody almost in real time online, right? There's these things which used to be solely the purview of the IC. That's not the world we live in today, right? Again, it's this information overload kind of thing. And it's going to require us to, to have these relationships with academia, um, with um, the commercial sector um, that we talk about. And, and I do really believe that we want but as soon as they run up against the traditional strictures, right, and walls and so forth, the traditional strictures almost always win out, right? So we haven't found a way yet. And I've asked myself, what does it take for us to actually address some of the things that I'm talking about, right? I mean, 9-11 um, wasn't enough, right? Um, 
uh, the financial crisis of 2008 obviously wasn't enough. Arab Spring wasn't enough, <laughs> you know, and then the pandemic, um, which I really thought the pandemic might be the one that would be enough, right? And, and we did make a lot of changes with the pandemic, which finally, which I think is great. Like for instance, the whole idea that people can, in the intelligence community have the opportunity to telework to some degree um, you know, that whoever would have ever thought that would ever be possible prior to the pandemic, I didn't see it happening, but, but at least there are some changes. But, in, but overall, everything that I've described here suggests that the pandemic um, also um, will not have proven to be enough for us to, to make some of these changes. Well, it seems to me anyway that how do you have a strict classified environment and deal with a lot of this? You know, I mean, it just... Uh... And again, it's a, it's an and issue, right? So there are, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not saying we have to, we want to throw everything out, right? And build something entirely new. We still have complicated problems. Right. Um, yes, yeah, so, we have to so deal with those. I'm not too. saying that we don't need that. I just would argue that the imbalance is probably pretty significant, right? We really mm -hmm. need to rebalance ourselves um, and make a lot, and, and, and I'm not sure that we're even close to doing that. That's a good segue to the next question by Barbara, which is how do global complex emerging issues get a place at the policy table and the IC table, hence in the, uh, uh, you know, our, our priority framework? Yeah, so um, they have to become, you know, we talk about them and we, 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 you know, there are people who think about climate and so forth. But these are things that don't s slot well into those organizational structures, into those accounts. Um, so we, you know, we 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 handicap ourselves in trying to address them. And this actually goes a little bit to something that you and I had talked about previously: this notion of what we consider to be a national security issue, mm -hmm. right? The traditional definition of a national security issue in a national security community, right? I would argue that though that has to totally change, right? Uh, the, and the people at the table, it's not just at the IC community at the table, you know, um, there's labor issues involved, there's agricultural issues involved, there's there's departments and things involved now in the national security world, which traditionally we wouldn't have thought of as national security players. But now we must. Yeah, I mean, there, that's going to go be ongoing. And it's also a question of like, because we have to be honest with ourselves on what's our value added on some of these issues in the intelligence community, in my opinion. No, I think that's absolutely right. That's a fundamental thing that's often hard for organizations to address. If you look at issues of organizational psychology, where I spend a fair amount of time um, trying to grapple really with what is your value added um, is a really hard question because it becomes sort of existential for people, right? Mm -hmm. like traditionally, our value added was we had information and hence insight into a system that nobody else had, right? If you wanted to know what was going on inside of the USSR, you had to come to us. Today, there are a few parts of the world where people cannot have insight and information um, that that is that we have that we have that kind of lock right it's a different so our whole value added you know principle what you know our organizing principle what is it that we add um, has to be something different than we have information that nobody else has right and I would argue it can be if, if we can build a community that is able to think effectively, about some of these problems in a way that is truly relevant to the policy levers that exist, um, then then that's value added. But it's a, it is a hard conversation to have. Look, any we were successful, I think, in a lot of ways during the Cold War. I think it's fair to say, if you look at the record, the intelligence community played a really really constructive role in helping to usher the Soviet Union and the Cold War into a peaceful grave. Right. So I think I think that's incontrovertible. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is we're now in a, in a very different environment. And, and for any organization that was successful in its past, it's really hard to change, right? 
part of the, that's part of the curse of success, right? The like Kodak is the classic example, right? They were so successful at doing something. They had a model and it worked for so long that even though they invented the thing that would eventually destroy their model, they couldn't bring themselves to really go all in on it, right? They right. couldn't walk away from what they had done and were doing and do something entirely new and it would end up being their demise, right? And I, 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 I hope that's not the case for us because I think in many ways it's worse in our situation because um, there is something we can provide and there is something that is needed if we can make the change. But, um, you know, companies come and go, but, you know, hopefully our, you know, our government and our way of life does not. Um, so I do think we have to find a way to, to be adaptable. Uh, thanks, Michael, for posting a link to Josh's article. Uh, and But he asked also, okay, so um, resources, books, articles on this. You've written about it. Uh, Muckrack is a good place to find Josh's articles in one place. Uh, but I also rec. What other things might you recommend for people to to get up to speed on complexity? So you know, it's a huge and diverse field. You know, a lot of people attacking it from various places. Sort of the the there there's there are pro there are there are educational components in this. The University of Michigan has a center that's doing a lot in the realm of complexity. I recommend that people explore the Santa Fe Institute, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of a nexus for complexity um, and education and go to their websites. There's extraordinary resources available. Uh, there's a whole massive literature out there that if you really dig into um, is great and worth exploring. Uh, I'm happy to field people if they have questions about this in terms of specific, like things that I would recommend people read. Um, usually I like to get a little bit more specific in terms of you know, how they're approaching the issue or what they're thinking. Um, because again, the literature is, is really diverse. But the first key is to understand that we're not talking about the same thing as complicated. Yeah, I, I got a lot out of uh, Melanie Mitchell's book on complexity, I, you know, for example. That was just something, and, you know, and, and also, uh, you get a sense there of how the definitions are still up in the air, even though it's yes. the community. Yes, there are multiple know. definitions. I actually yeah. love Melanie Mitchell's stuff. She yeah. actually is, is a professor at the Santa Fe Institute. Yeah. And if you go to the Santa Fe Institute website, um, there's some links, I think, through the education. You, you might have to dig to find it, but they offer a course called Complexity Explorer, which mm. is kind of a fundamental introduction to complexity. I highly recommend it. It's online. Um, and if you really want to begin to explore about what we're talking about when we're talking about complexity, um, then th that's probably a great place to begin. Right. And just an aside, I mean, part of what she discusses, of course, is order, order coming out of complexity, new, new order coming out of it. I mean, not, this is not leading to chaos necessarily. No, that's right. And emerging phenomena, actually, I mean, it's, it has an order to it, right? Yeah. Um, it's just that it's unpredictable. And that's one of the defining characteristics of complexity, right? It's, um, but there is, there is order. There, there's a certain degree of beauty in, in, in emergence, right? Sort of the classic example of an emergent phenomena is the flocking of birds, right? Yeah. Um, you know, there's a beauty and an order there and you can see it, right? It's incredibly complex and it's not predictable. Um, even though it's built on each of those birds had just working off the three fundamental rules. It's just the way it all happens when you put them all together. Right. And I just would, I would just recommend that, that, that you, that people dig into this and, and, and the, the Santa Fe website is a great place to start. Um, right. And the complexity explorer course is a great place. Thank you, uh, Ryan. I hope that answers your question about an appropriate metaphor for complexity. I think that's a good one. Um, what do you think about um, this question on, uh, are we rewarding, is the IC rewarding um, uh, an analysts for trying to take on issues of complexity or, or uh, are, we, are we finding ways in which to incentivize analysts to be thinking more about this? So this is, a, this is great. So um, one of the issues that I'm really interested in, and although I haven't done that much work in it yet, is our metrics, right? So how do we measure analytic success in this environment? And metrics is a really fundamental conversation because 
metrics are not only measures of success, but they're also incentives, right? What an organization measures, well, that often, that sends this message to the workforce what it values. So they will, workforce will often give what the organization is measuring. And in the intelligence community, um, unfortunately, we still often tend to measure production, right? It's a very industrial age kind of metric, right? You, you know, from your background and I don't, from, and, I, and, and, and although we say we don't want to do that, right? We want to measure, we would like to measure impact. Um, impact is very hard to measure, whereas production, the count, is 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 ostensibly measurable, right? We can look at it and say this this analyst wrote twelve products in this period, and this analyst wrote five. So, you know, by production, I'm going to give this one, you know, you know, the awards. It's not a good measure. It's a terrible measure, right? Again, as I said, it's an industrial age measure, but it's measurable. It's really hard to measure impact. So we always say in the IC we don't want to count. But then um, I've been on enough career service panels, you probably have as well, been involved. We often just revert to the count because we measure what's measurable. So this issue of metrics in complex environments um, is a fundamental thing which we need to explore. Now, fortunately, we're not the only ones who struggle with this. Almost every corporation and organization um, is wrestling with this issue itself, particularly if they're in the information field, right? Because it's not enough to just turn out quantity anymore to have value added um, you have to look at sort of are you saying something that is truly offering insight and this is my balance to the predictability thing i don't think we should be measuring if we get predictions right mm -hmm. uh, most of the time we won't when we're dealing with complexity but i do think we can explore whether or not we actually offered any insight have we actually improved understanding of the challenge of the problem i think that is measurable um, but fundamentally, this is this is just such an important issue. Uh, Google for a while had a whole issue, a whole effort trying to explore how do you measure success in the environment that we're in today. Uh, I'm not sure where that effort went, or even if it's still extant. But um, but it just goes to show you how fundamental a question it is. But I would argue that even in the Intel community, we still too often revert to production, just because it's measurable. Right. We say we want to do something else and we do want to do something else, but we simply don't know what that is that we can measure. So we just kind of default to production. And that is going to hamstring us for a long time because, you know, you measure that and what you get is the churn. Right. Analysts just crank it out. It's not even necessarily good, but they're just responding to the incentive structure. And at the end of the day, I would argue when we do that, we end up throwing more dust in the air then we actually lend clarity, right? Because what you end up is with a ton of products often on the same issue, often saying completely different things and policymakers become bewildered, right? They go, well, this one says this and this one says the exact opposite and I simply don't know and there's so much. I think we need to get out of this idea that we should just be cranking it out and really explore. And this goes to the conversation about that you added, you know, and well, yeah. impact. I, I'm gonna, Connor has a question somewhat related to this. Let me see. I'm going to try to I'm going to try to rephrase it a little bit, Connor. All right. What I what I'm thinking about here is you are talking a lot about foresight and how we can have and how we can um, you know demonstrate that. And it's different from prediction or forecast or anything like that. But and here's the here's the question: How in an environment today, especially when we have analytics standards and everything, how do you do that how, when you don't have reporting necessarily? Right? You don't have yeah. you don't have the you don't have the traditional reporting on it, but you have this insight, uh, perhaps foresight on something an emergent threat. Yeah, it's that's so that's a great and a fundamental question. Sure, the the ICD two hundred three standards um, did not really help in this in this area. Right, um, because you know we many ways are still thinking about the traditional like people. This is another area of sloppy language. People talk about forecasting and foresight when they're fundamentally different things. Right, um, foresight is a much more imaginative process, and the IDCD standards don't give a lot of room for imagination. Right, you could argue that standard four does, um, but I would also argue standard four is probably 
um, probably the, were the worst at implementing that one, right? Um, and when we do think about it, we just think about, oh, just one alternative or two alternatives, the kind of the prevailing line. So um, this issue of imagination and foresight is something that we've traditionally struggled with as a community in terms of even having the products that allow it um, and our ability to say it because again, we've always had very high sourcing requirements and it's really hard to source foresight. So I think this is a question that extends across a range of our processes and habits, right? There, there are different products required. Um, there are certainly different people. There are different organizations and tools. And maybe we have to think about putting them together somewhere else because we can't make them work in the existing structures and processes. But, uh, but, it, but it is a fundamental truth is that what I am talking about when I'm talking about really it's anticipating anticipatory intelligence um, right. emergence is really a, a, an, an incredibly imaginative process. And that process is really hard to, to sort of cultivate, foster and promote within our existing organizational structures, habits, incentive structures. Um, so it becomes a fundamental issue, right? You're not going to change it just by saying, well, we're going to have this kind of a product, right? You're going to have to change organizations. You're going to have to change people. You're going to have to train educational processes and training. Um, before you know it, it becomes sort of a comprehensive challenge for us. But, but it, is, it is the fundamental issue. Foresight is a different thing. Uh, we have a question from Ken. Ken, I'm going to boil this down to your last point here. What else could we do structurally to increase our ability to deal with complex problems? I mean, you're, you're in the OD not. I mean, this is where you're in the right place for this. Well, we could debate that. Um, but I will That's say, right. uh, um, so there's this issue about structures, right? Um, you can try to create structures within the existing structure that are different. When you do that, traditionally, the prevailing structure will, will generate antibodies, close in on, and destroy the new one, right? Because it doesn't really match. We've seen this happen before in the IC, where the ICs tried to create an entity that was very different from the existing entities, and the existing entities um, almost automatically closed in by just this thing is different. So we either fence it off. Um, so so the, I guess there's there's two models here, right? There's one model is to try to build it on the inside and you know try to infuse this throughout the existing. That's hard. Um, the other model is sort of the skunk works model at Lockheed, right? Where you build an entity that is outside the existing structure. And it may thrive outside the existing structure, but it can't infuse the larger structure, right? So despite the success of the Skunk Works, um, it hasn't changed in, in, despite all its success, it hasn't changed Big Lockheed, mm -hmm. right? So we could create an outside entity outside the intelligence community or the existing intelligence community. It might do this work well, but it wouldn't, infuse the larger intelligence community. But that's problem problematic because that would mean most of your resources would still go into doing what you've always done. You know, the sort of better, stronger, faster, smarter thing, which is really just a way of saying, just do the same thing. And that's a problem, right? So in terms of rebalancing it, the question then becomes, well, then do you build it on the inside? If you build it on the inside, maybe it doesn't survive. So um, I don't know that there's a good answer here. Different organizations, you know, Lockheed, has done what it's done. And I think the Skunk Works has been incredibly successful as a parallel to Big Lockheed. Boeing did the same thing with the Phantom Works. Um, we have to explore as a community what would be the best model for us. Um, my, my sense of history is that trying to build it on the inside is, has so far not been particularly successful. Um, but trying to build it on the outside might not work either. Or, or maybe, maybe the idea is to build something that's not, you know, because we're talking about labor and agriculture and all these things that we're traditionally not used to thinking about, um, maybe it is a whole different entity somewhere, right? People have proposed um, within, within, within the office of the president, you know, or, or something. Um, but yeah, but structurally, this is a, as we talked about in the beginning, 
this comes back to that. It, it is a real, a real it's, it's more of a question that I'm not sure what the answer is other than the fact that we have to, at some point, grapple with it. We're at the top of the hour. I'd like to thank everybody uh, for joining us today to talk about complexity with Josh Kerbel. Uh, very interesting talk, Josh. Um, we'll be keeping in touch with your, with your writings on it. Um, I want to also uh, alert everybody that uh, in a week, uh, we'll be talking to uh, two uh, South Korean experts on the problem of uh, nuclear politics in the Korean Peninsula. That'll be on November 16th on Inside Intelligence. Uh, but right now, I just want to thank you, Josh, and um, I hope you can come back and we can uh, follow up on this conversation. I think that there's a, we probably could have gone for hours. Yeah, I, as you can tell, I probably can. But, but thank you so much. Thank you to everybody. Um, I, I hope it came through that I, that I really do enjoy talking about this. So um, if you want me back, I'm always available. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, yeah, the complexity part two. Yeah. So, uh, okay, great. So thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you.